Well, good evening, everybody. It's 8 o'clock once again on Sunday night. Welcome to Patriots of Christ live broadcast. My name is Paul Palmer. For those of you that haven't uh, joined us before, we try to go live every Sunday night about 8 o'clock and see who shows up. So anyway, uh, if you catch it live, great. If you catch it on the replay, great. Either way, we're just uh, privileged and blessed to come into your house this way. So, hey, Brother Scott and Brother Bobby, glad you guys are here as usual. The, some of the faithful are showing up. So anyway, we just encourage everybody when you can, uh, Sunday at 8 o'clock, uh, we go live. That seems to be a good time. And uh, old Paul, Brother Paul Eldridge in Oklahoma City, God bless you, brother. Seems to be a good time. Hopefully, everybody's had just a wonderful Sunday today. For those of you that have uh, local churches and uh, church family uh, that you fellowship with, I hope you've been able to be partakers of that today and uh, get built up in Christ. This ministry is specifically for men. God said uh, back in May of this year that he was stirring the hearts of the men of this nation and that uh, he was calling them off the sidelines and placing them back in ordained positions in their families and local churches and in his kingdom as men. And he said he wanted us to put a call out to him. So Patriots of Christ was born out of that obedience to God to put a call out to men to come and join us. It is a, a new movement. It's sweeping across Oklahoma and uh, we're looking currently at expanding into Southwest Oklahoma and Northwest Oklahoma. So if you see this broadcast and you're in Southwest or Northwest Oklahoma and you want to begin to gather men, just uh, slip us a note, get hold of us, and we will uh, begin to dialogue and set up a meeting and conversation with you. So, Father, we just thank you for tonight's broadcast. We thank you for the Word of God. We pray, Father, that your Word will continue to do uh, what it's supposed to do, that you said it would do, as it's sent forth, it will fulfill its purposes and will not return to you void until it has accomplished its purpose. Just like the rain comes down from the heavens and the snow comes down from the mountains and waters the earth and brings forth growth in the grass and the herb, so is your word, Father. It will not return void until it has accomplished what you sent it out to do. And we give you praise and glory for it in Jesus' precious holy name. Hallelujah. So anyway, we've been talking about the subject of guarding our hearts. This is the third Sunday that we've come together with this subject. And uh, because it says in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, God instructs us to guard our heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The issues of life do not come out of our situations. They, hey, good evening, Brother Russell. God bless you. I sure am glad you joined us tonight. But uh, the issues of our life do not come out of our circumstances, do not come out of our situations, but all the issues of our, our life flow out of our heart. And in that word, God told us that we were to keep and we told you in the first week that word keep means to guard, uh, to watch over, uh, just to, to really watch over and keep. Just like it was the same word we told you that God used with Adam. Hey, good, good evening, Brother Kent. Uh, God bless you. Thank you for the food, brother. We ate on that tonight, and we enjoyed it. So thank you very much. And tell Edie, thank you very much. So... Uh, but that word keep is the same word that God used with Adam in the garden when he said, keep the garden. And today, it's the same way, guys. We keep the garden. We guard it. We watch over it. We protect it. The garden uh, of our heart that where we meet God, where the kingdom of God is deposited. So, And we use Paul as an example, <clears throat> excuse me, that first week. And we found out that he considered guarding his heart his daily work. He said this. He said, therein do I exercise myself to have a conscience void of offense towards God and towards man. So we told you 
the heart that casts all its care over on God is free from all anxiety and is kept in uh, through God's perfect peace. But we also said that to keep that heart in peace in a pure atmosphere has to be breathed in in order to keep it healthy. And so last week we looked at uh, what it looks like uh, to be guarding your heart. And we, we told you some things like, number one, one of the things it looks like is you have to set the Lord before you. And that just means that you need to understand that God's eye is ever upon you, it says in the Bible. It means that we have to remember that we have to give him a full account of our stewardship while we're down here in the earth and let that lead and guide us in, in our heart every day. It also means that we keep his honor and glory before us, not just living to serve our own selves. So we, uh, I think it was Scott Elston. Uh, yeah, matter of fact, Scott, you were discussing that with me on the phone. Scott said uh, uh, to the Lord one day, he said, Lord, everything I'm going to do today will be to glorify you at work. So we need to have his glory and his honor in mind as we live our lives. It also means that we should strive to have God before our hearts. And this is a biggie for me anyway. We should have God before our hearts when we engage in any religious activity. You know, we can't go uh, before the king of glory uh, just half cocked, not thinking about his presence and just saying the first thing that comes to our mind uh, with church services. Uh, just we have such a this spirit that has such an attitude of familiarity with the things of God kind of slipshod, laid back. And I'm not saying it's not bad to lay back, but we just can't, you know, we, there's a certain amount of reverence that you have for your heavenly father. So we need to understand that uh, we have him before our hearts. Number two, we told you that it looks like uh, when you're guarding your heart, you watch it diligently. And we'll talk about that tonight. I really want to get into that tonight. So we must set aside to be judged. You have to set aside some time during the day just to check yourself. Where are you? Where is your heart? Which direction is it going to? Where are your affections going to? Uh, how am I feeling about prayer? How am I feeling about reading God's word? Am I just discharging a, a duty or am I more passionate and pouring myself out to God in prayer than ever before? You know, am I going forward? Or am I going backwards? And then we also said that you, you, it means you need to attend to holiness. Uh, in other words, keep your heart means to, uh, how do I say this? You need to be attentive to whether you're growing in holiness or you're decaying. Uh, I have a brother that, uh, uh, has a saying, and I don't, I don't like it, but it's my brother in Marlow, Oklahoma. But a lot of times when I call him to check on him, I'll say, how you doing, Vance? He said, oh, I'm mildewing. You know, we don't want to be mildewing, gentlemen. We want to be fresh and vibrant. We don't want to sit around and be decaying. So tonight, I want to talk to you about that diligent effort. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart with all diligence. Hey, Good evening, Brother Charlie. I'm glad you uh, you uh, joined us tonight. I've been watching some of your stuff. God bless you, Charlie. I'm really glad you're with us tonight. So uh, I want to look at the word diligence in its original meaning, and it might shock you at first, but uh, what that word diligence means where God said, guard your heart with all diligence. Hey, Brother Daryl, God bless you. Glad you're with us tonight, too. God bless you. And... Uh, Phil Pitts. Hey, Phil, you got back up on uh, Facebook. I'm glad you're back in. Phil got knocked off by some uh, drone or virus or something, but he's back with us. God bless you. God bless all the guys in Oklahoma City, Brother Phil. So anyway, that word diligence, guys, actually means, listen to this, a place of confinement. Or we can say a prison. Isn't that strange at first? Or it means a guard or a guard post or watch or observance. So when it talks about a guard, it's referring to uh, it's referring to the man as being a guard. Okay. 
And let me give you some some examples, and maybe it'll kind of help uh, clear it up. So let me scroll down here as you guys are or uh, beginning to write things over here. So Charlie Jones says greetings, and Brother Bob said, uh, check this. He's sharing it with somebody. All right, says check this out, Brother God. Bobby just uh, has been so faithful in, in sharing Patriots of Christ with people. And uh, so we always tell everybody, share, share, share. So Genesis 40 and chap, uh, verse 3 says this, and he put them in ward. That word ward is the same word diligence. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And here's another example. Genesis 42 and 19 says, if you be true, man, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. That word prison, again, is the same word as diligence. And he said, uh, if you be true, man, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye carry corn for the famine in your houses. So we can say this, that that word diligence is likened onto a war or a prison where all those or whatever is there are watched with diligence and guarded. Now, that's the point. Uh, Nehemiah says this in chapter 4 and verse 9 says, Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God, and we set a watch. That See, that word watch is the same word as diligence. We uh, set a watch against them day and night because of them, their enemy, obviously. And then finally, we see in the Old Testament, Job said this, Am I a sea, S-E-A, sea, or a whale, that thou settest a watch? And that's the word diligence. Set a watch over me. So Proverbs 4.23, guys, says that keep thy heart with all diligence. Keep thy heart in war, ward, excuse me. Keep thy heart in a watch. Establish a watch over it. Confine it. Build borders around it and protect it. And obviously, we told you there's a various reasons for that and why God thinks that's so important. That's because where you and God commune. It's the garden that where you and uh, God, like Adam did in the cool of evening, you guys meet. It's where he's deposited his uh, His grace functions in your heart. It's where the kingdom of God resides. So it, it's a very, very important place. So it becomes easier. Let me scroll down here. It becomes easier for us to see uh, by these examples that I talked about that the word watch means, hey, Michael, how you doing? God bless you. I'm glad you joined us. That the word uh, 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 diligence means exactly what it's intended. It means to put a watch over your heart. Be diligent. It's as if you can find your heart uh, in an area. We can say God's area and his kingdom because that's where uh, what's deposited in there. And then you establish a day-to-day -day watch over all the activities to ensure it doesn't escape, break out into areas that it doesn't belong or nothing breaks in uh, to it that doesn't belong there. So diligence is necessary. Let me, let me just use a couple examples here. It's, it's the same way, guys, if, if, if a very poor person uh, is expecting to uh, be rich, without being diligent in some type of business or some types of employment. It's just not going to happen. Or let's take a, a real weak person who uh, has a desire to become strong, but doesn't undertake eating the right foods or exercising. Uh, it's the same way uh, for a Christian to become rich in our faith and strong in the Lord without making it a diligent effort. It's, it's uh, guys, Excuse me, it's just not going to happen. It's also true, I know some of you guys might say, well, uh, unless the Lord blessed it, all our labor amounts to nothing. That's in Psalm 127 and 1. I, I get it. I understand it. And there's also, apart from him, we can do nothing. Jesus said that in John 15 and 5. But it's also true, it says this, guys, in Proverbs 13 and 4, that the soul of the diligent will be made fat. And so... That's just a way of saying that for, for a farmer, for example, my grandfather was a large farmer in North Dakota. Uh, 
And he was a great Christian man, a man of the word, a man that built churches. And uh, Todd led his family to the Lord and instilled uh, godly values in his house. And actually, he feared the Lord. But uh, he totally believed that he had limited power to make his fields produce. And, uh, or he could even say that it was totally dependent on the sovereign will of God to, to make his fields produce. And he, and he believed in prayer. He was a man of prayer. But he also knew that unless he discharged his duties, unless he did his part, the barns that he had out there, they were going to be empty. And, and so it is with us spiritually. We have to discharge our duties in guarding our heart. And part of that is just being diligent to do it. Uh, let me say this. God, however, hasn't called us to be robots. Uh, he hasn't called us to have an attitude of passiveness either. He tells us to work all the way from the beginning. He told Adam to uh, keep and work the garden. Every person God's ever used in their lives, if you want to research the Bible, uh, they've, been, uh, they've been busy. Uh, they've been hard at it at something. And every person that God used, they were busy. The sad thing is that many people today, let me scroll down again, modern Christians today would say this is religious steps. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, Brother Bobby, because we have this uh, easy, what I call this easy religion today, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. But, you know, it, it's, uh, it's work. Uh, if you, and I don't mean to get, uh, legalistically, and, and like I said, God doesn't want robots, but we have a part to do in this, and uh, in this relationship, and uh, God's given us great and gracious things, and it's up to us to own it and be responsible for the things that he has deposited so richly in our hearts, but anyway, the sad thing is many people today are engaged in really spiritually the wrong task and given most of their attention to uh, incidental things and they neglect the very fundamental things which is to keep your heart with all diligence. This is the great work that our Heavenly Father ha has assigned to every one of us as his children. And uh, I think I told you a story about one time, the first open vision I had when God began to tell me what the most important thing was to him. And he told me uh, after the vision, he asked me, do you know what's important to me? And obviously I, I couldn't answer him because I was crying, but he said, a man's heart, Paul, because if I can have a man's heart, 150%, I can get something done. So the heart is very important. And that's why it's such a battle. Uh, Satan wants, uh, wants to make inroads into a man's heart. You know, if we were to take a survey today, and I don't want to stay on the negative side, uh, of the majority of professing Christians today about all their concerns and their possessions, we'd find that the vast majority of uh, uh, are not guarding their hearts. The vast majority. They're, they're, uh, they're guarding other interests, their reputations, possessions, their bodies, finances, and all that's important, but it's almost like today, most people leave their hearts to uh, go whatever direction it wants to go. Or they allow things to enter their hearts that doesn't have any business uh, being in their hearts. So our hearts must be placed in the area like into our, our human heart, if I can use that, and uh, keep it under guard. And the guard is us in the Holy Spirit. God enables us to do the guarding with his grace. But if, guys, if you look at our physical hearts, you know, there's a verse in the Bible in Romans 1.20, I believe it says that the, the invisible things of God can be understood by the things that are seen. So if you take the human heart, and it's encased, by the way, it is enclosed, like if we say like in a prison, it is enclosed. But <clears throat> the human heart pumps blood throughout all the body and feeding it <clears throat> and it's either pumping disease or it's pumping health and it depends upon what's been allowed in it and so it is with our heart if we allow pride arrogance uh, impure lust 
and the things like that, uh, our whole life is going to be tainted and slanted towards those things that, that we allow in our heart. You know, the Bible says, uh, uh, so is the heart, so is the man. And I know I'm paraphrasing it, but what's in your heart it <coughs> is what's going to come out. So if those kind of things are allowed into our hearts to remain there for a time, ultimately it's going to affect our character and our conduct. So the bottom line is, guys, our hearts, let me scroll again, uh, patient endurance, Charlie Johnson said, Hebrews 10, 6, very good, Charlie. Way to go, Brother Charlie. Patience and endurance, yes. You know, the spring of our lives, our heart, it just, guys, it just needs to be kept pure and, and, and keep poison out of the stream that, that goes to our heart. The Bible says that a man is what his heart is, Proverbs 23, 7. I, let me say this. If anyone, and we know the loss, if anyone is dead, his heart's dead unto God, then guys, I'm going to say this. There's nothing in him that's alive. I know that's a powerful statement. But, you know, the life of God's not in him. So he's just carrying death. But, but if your heart's right with God, then everything will be right, even in your greatest challenges. So what is the heart? The heart is that central most inner being. Uh, Peter called it the hidden man of the heart. It's the real you that gives control. It gives expression to everything you do and everything that you are. It's the hidden man of the heart. And so to keep or put in war to guard the heart is the work that God has assigned us. And he enables us to do it. We have to keep our imaginations. We have to keep from excessive pride from our own achievements. We have to keep our understanding from errors. We have to keep our will from uh, perverseness and our conscience clear of guilt and our affections from being set on evil things. It's really just that simple when you get down to it. We also need to watch over our mind from being occupied with worthless subjects and of course, keep our whole being from being possessed uh, from Satan. So that's the work God's given us to do. And it's the same as his first instruction to Adam, guys. I want to look at four areas before we jump off here tonight. That means that looks like being diligent. Number one, <clears throat> we need to shut out everything that's opposed to God. I'm serious. If there's anything that's opposed to God, you know, it can almost be considered an idol. First John 5, 21 says, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. And because our Heavenly Father does not allow rivals a competition in the heart, he has uh, reserved the throne of our hearts for himself. And he won't breach any revival. And so we're to resist and fight anything that would draw our affections away from him. James 4, 7 says this. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know what I like about that? <clears throat> that word says he will flee from you means that he will run in holy terror. <laughs> How do you like that? The devil would run from you in holy terror, and what you have to do is just submit to God, resist him, and he'll flee from you. Man, God's got your back. When you feel that your affections are being drawn to other things which are opposed to God, it's your duty to resist and fight those things from entering your heart. It's your duty. And so for us as Christians to keep our hearts with diligence means that we often, we, we should be paying very close attention to our affections. Which way are they going? Our Father has told us, put your affections on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. And uh, I'm not going to go into there. That We'll have to reserve that for another time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a big subject, isn't it? Number two, we bring our hearts into conformity with the word. We're to stay faithful to study God's word until it becomes imprinted on our hearts. Uh, I'm going to try to go a little bit quicker here because I feel I need to pray uh, for you guys tonight.
Charlie Johnson says, ha, too. Ken Carpenter says, yes, amen. Let me pull my chair back up. Uh, here's what's always kind of gotten me. I've wondered many times why it is that we can hear a real moving sermon, and, you know, and hallelujah, praise God, amen, that's right, brother. And then two or three days later, we can't even tell you what he talked about, or just in general, but we can't really grasp or apply it or live it out because we've already forgotten it. I always wondered about that, and it bothered me. Matter of fact, I laid hands on my head one time and told God, help me, I need help. Well, I found two main reasons. Listen to this. God told Joshua this. He said, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate in there day and night, and thou may observe us to do all the accordings therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua 1 and verse 9. So Joshua knew he had to meditate therein day and night. And then in James 1.22, it says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. So it's just not hearing a good sermon get preached, but it's continuing in the word. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So it's the truth that we know that sets us free. The truth can be right over there, right before us. The truth can be preached. The truth can be put right before you and set on the table. But if you don't get it and, and apply it and act on it, as James said, or meditate in it like Joshua does, or continue in it and read more about it, you're not going to know it for yourself. It won't internalize and become part of you. So we have an obligation to continue in the word or be like Joshua and, uh, the, and the other reason is, is why I found out that uh, we don't retain uh, when it comes to the things of God is we have an enemy. We have an enemy that's like an ever ready battery. When the truth of God's word comes to us, he wants to steal it. We have an enemy that tries to make it very inconvenient to continue in God's word. We have, have you ever noticed this? Uh, sometimes you say, well, I'm going to sit in here. I'm going to study. You know, you take, get in your own strength, you know, and you make these resolutions within yourself. And uh, you, you start reading. And the first thing that you find out, your eyes start getting tired. You start getting the yawns. You start getting a little weary. Listen, guys, we have an enemy out there. And he'll throw anything at us to rob us of the truth of God's word to keep us from becoming who we are. Number one, we have a duty to continue in the word. Number two, we have an enemy. And I found those things to be true in regarding to retaining the word of God. So we need to, and number three, we need to keep ourselves tender to sin, be in diligence. You know, uh, when you were a sinner, most likely, uh, like most people, you uh, you didn't make a lot of distinction between sin and crime in as far as the law of the land was concerned. And as long as you were, you know, stayed a pretty good fellow and, and kept your reputation halfway clean, you thought, you know, you, you were okay. And uh, But when you got born again, if you're like me, you probably found a hundred things that uh, might be lawful according to the law, but man, you couldn't do them. It, it, it would oppose God. And uh, as you look back over your life after you've been born again and you look back there, you, you probably, if you were like a lot of us, you, th you thought, boy, my life was, was really in total rebellion against God most of my life. So uh, what I'm saying is when you first got born again, you had this tenderness towards what sin was. And I've seen many people in the body of Christ in my 36 years, 37 years almost of serving the Lord. It seems like the older they get, the less tender they get about sin and the more familiar they get with God. And it becomes a tradition. Listen, hopefully one of these days we'll teach about spiritual maturity, but time and time and alone will not make a person spiritually mature. It's what you do with that time. And then finally, guys, you've got to look after cleansing your heart. 
to be diligent means that you watch after cleansing yourselves, crying out. You know, let me ask you a question. Have you ever found yourself saying something like this? I have. Lord, sometimes my heart is just, <laughs> it feels like dirt. Things want to come in and go. Listen to me. Be very thankful that God's given you grace in your life to be able to say that in the first place. Because there's a lot of people that don't even have any discernment at all. But God's working something different in you. Thank God that he's given you such a heart as to want to look at your heart in the first place. Obviously, he's made a big difference uh, from you and the multitude that never give any thought to the condition of their heart. And if you're like a lot of people, you may say sometimes that, well, it seems I had, I had a gentleman in Tulsa, a matter of fact, I won't name his name, but he was uh, in his 70s and he come up after me and he said, Paul, sometimes I feel like I've gotten all this crusty stuff down in my heart. And he said, when you preached about righteousness, it set me free. But you know, sometimes when you walk through this world, things do touch you. And that's why you need to see the cleansing all the time. It's just like a garden. I, I like my gardens. And, uh, you know, yeah. let me put it this way. I go out in the garden. I plant it. I, I till up the dirt and all that stuff. And it's beautiful when I first get it ready. And then after things starting to grow, you know what? I may find weeds growing in that garden. Unwanted. I did not plant those weeds. They came up by themselves. And then later there might be some slugs come in my garden and some pests and bugs get on my plants. And I didn't invite them in. I didn't put those bugs and slugs in there. But here's the deal. What do I do? Just sit down and cry and say, oh, my goodness, there's weeds in my garden. Oh, my goodness. Look at them pests and bugs. I guess it's just going to have to stay that way. No, no, no. So it is with the heart. Things may come across our screen, but, guys, it does not have to stay in our hearts. It does not have to. The weeds in our garden do not have to stay there. You know, I've had people tell me, Brother Paul, I can't help or control such things. They just come at me. And yeah, I know the devil wants you to think that you're a helpless person. You can't do anything about that. That's a lie from hell because God has told us that to uh, keep our hearts, to guard them. So we have his grace and his ability to do it. But guys, it is our obligation and duty to discharge the keeping of our hearts. So listen, we don't listen to the lies of the devil. We keep our hearts clean by getting rid of all the unclean things like they did in the temple. They pulled everything out and threw them on a trash heap and burned them. First John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins before God, he's just and he's faithful to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, therefore making us righteous again. 1 Peter 1.22 tells us, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit of God. So let's close tonight and let's say this. Father, you know, you've instructed us to keep our hearts with all diligence tonight. In and of ourselves, sometimes, Lord, we just feel inadequate to accomplish a task like that. So we ask you to help us to accomplish that in the power of your spirit, according to your word. And so make your work in us to will and do your good pleasure in Jesus' precious holy name. So, Father, I pray for these men tonight that heard this word, that they will understand, Father, the importance of guarding their heart. And how much you want to move inside them and be in them and reveal yourself to them and expand your kingdom inside them to the point where you build this superstructure on the inside of every man to where sometimes there's just a suddenly there's an explosion in the natural of the supernatural because somebody has guarded the kingdom of God within their hearts and is releasing the grace of God into the earth to all those around them 
so people can see your goodness and kindness and they can see you shining brightly in the men of God on this broadcast tonight. Well, I bless you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you for you guys that is going to catch the replay. And I just look forward to meeting many of you soon. There's been some exciting things happening in prayer. God's called me out this morning in prayer. A lot of exciting things coming to Patriots of Christ. Hey, keep us in prayers. And guys, the regional meetings coming up on the Saturdays. Get to those regional meetings. Walk across the room. Shake the hand of another man of God. Let's get hooked up and let's get some things done for God in this earth. God bless you. You guys have the sweet sleep of the righteousness. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.